Hello, heathens. I'm Megan Angus, and this is Spinning the Wheel Podcast. In this weekly audio ritual, we explore the eight seasons of the witch's wheel of the year, and we discover how it is so much more than eight sabbats. We weirding witches time travel through holy days, festivals, and celestial events connecting our celebrations and magic to the past, present, and future. Our cackling fills the night as we take our turn gathering the wool, wielding the distaff, and spinning the wheel. Welcome back, and thank you for joining me for yet another week of this foolishness that we call (laughs) Spinning the Wheel Podcast. Uh, This week, we are looking at Letha Season, Waxing Moon in Libra, Lunar Week 22 by some lunar calendars. Uh, This week, we have a lot of really cool festivals, past and present, and we have a lot of really crunchy astrology. Okay, I know. Uh, <laughs> just when you thought it was, uh, you know, just crappy, here's a little extra crappy. But, um, you know, we have a lot of really cool advice from ancestors and from the gods and goddesses and the earth, her, its, their self. Um, so let's heed it right? (laughs) What's all this for if we're not going to, you know, actively try to make our situation a little bit better with it? So, um, you know, we are in Letha season, as I just said. If you are like, what is Letha? Uh, I have a whole page of uh, information about the witch's sabbat Letha on my website. I also have a class that I taught last year on my YouTube channel, about two hours long. Uh, You will be absolutely stuffed to the brim on information about Letha. It's out there, man. Um, But if you're like, girl, I know what Letha is. Okay, then let's get on with it. Um, (laughs) This month, we are going to have another Wheel of the Year class. I haven't picked the date yet (laughs) because I, as a professional, totally have my shit together. Um, but it will be towards the end of the month, and that class is going to be on the next upcoming Sabbath, Lunasad, or Lunasa, or Lamas. It is uh, called and pronounced all of these different ways and things. Um, that'll be towards the end of the month. Uh, Lunasa, or Lunasad, uh, falls on August 1st. So the class will be before that. <laughs> and the other class that I'm going to be teaching this month uh, is for my patrons. Um, this class is available at all levels of patronage, which start at a buck. Uh, and that is going to be our monthly tarot circle, which is our community building workshop where we get together and talk about stuff through the lens of tarot. Um, it's definitely a collaborative effort and, uh, I really love doing tarot circle. I think it's super fun and it's a cool way to meet people and talk about magic and explore ideas in a safe space where there really are kind of no wrong questions or no bad ideas. It really is just a sandbox or a playground for us to mess around with magical concepts. Um, if you want to know more about all of this stuff, As I said, you can head to my website and read about it. Um, But if you want to be in the know when classes are coming up and get even more information, sign up for my irregular newsletter. Uh, It's irregular because I don't send it on any kind of a regular schedule. (laughs) And if you want even more, sign up to my Patreon. Um, That is where I put a lot of my unpublished work uh, behind the scenes struggles, <laughs> um, and other things that I'm, I'm not going to share with the public or I don't share with the public initially, you know, you have to wait a year before you can get it. Come and check it out. Um, also, if you want to support this podcast, please sign up to my Patreon. Um, 
so many thank yous <laughs> to my patrons. Uh, but if monetarily supporting me is not something that's realistic for your situation, because hello, it's 2022, and that's super real for lots of us right now, um, you can always leave a review or a rating wherever it is that you listen to this podcast. Uh, that is one of the most helpful ways that, that you can support this podcast, as well as posting it on social media. Uh, because I am there less and less these days. <laughs> um, that's definitely been something that I've needed to do for myself is to really restrict uh, my interaction with social media. So uh, you can do it for me. And I appreciate it. If you are out there in the wilds of the of the social medias, um, reposting this podcast is incredibly helpful. And I really, really appreciate it. Um, there's links to my website, links to my Patreon in the description of this podcast. Let's get into it, shall we? Okay, to orient us in our work, we are, as I said, in Letha season. And our witches' work that we are focusing on during the Sabbat season of Letha is power, transformation, healing, fertility and determination. Um, something I talk about a lot in the Letha class is stepping into your power and what does it mean to step into your power? And a big part of that, not the first part, but a big part of that is determination, claiming things, um, and committing to things. We've thrown lots of seeds in the ground during spring, and during Letha season, we are picking which of those projects are the ones that are going to get our attention and our nurturing and our protection and our support, knowing that some of the experiments that we started in spring are not going to move all the way through. And that's just the way it is. doesn't mean that we can't come back to them later. doesn't mean that we can't come back to them next time that we come around this part of the cycle. Um, but that's, that's a lot of what's happening for us in Letha. Undergirding a lot of the work that we're doing is a, it's claiming determination, maturation, um, accepting the responsibility of seeing a, a thing through. Um, and in our global themes, uh, in our festivals and holidays that we see past and present, we see a big heavy emphasis on partnership of a variety of types, uh, life and vitality abundance and light and warmth during this quarter holiday. Um, as a side note, the goddess in this season is stepping fully into their mother goddess form, quote unquote, and the Holly King who has just taken over from the Oak King is also stepping into their power. Um, and so because of that, this is the last Sabbath to overtly emphasize fertility. Um, now, we will also have some emphasis on fertility during Lunasad or Lunasa or Lamas season that we're going to come to uh, on August 1st, as I mentioned. But this is the last Sabbath that's like really, really, really dedicated to fertility. We are at the height of the solar arc, the thrust, yang, extrovert energy that uh, all of us embody. Um, or can embody. And that is sort of inherent to the solar process um, because it really only wanes from here to, to winter solstice or Yule. It's just downhill from here on out. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's get this um, show started with our waxing half moon in Libra at 14 degrees at 7.14 p.m. Pacific Standard Time later in the day slash the next day for everybody else around the planet. July 6th, which is a Wednesday. And this moon is trine Venus and Gemini and is opposing Chiron in Aries. We have a little bit of other stuff going on this week with Venus. We have a lot of other stuff going on with Chiron this week. Um, and Chiron can be a tough celestial body entity object to deal with. Uh, it can bring up a lot of really painful stuff for us that also feels very, very personal. 
It's It generally doesn't just represent pain or suffering that we witness in the world, but pain or suffering that we deeply identify with. Um, and it can be really subjective. It can be stuff that like another person could look at that thing or experience that moment and be fine with it. And we are totally knocked off of our stability, right? We're totally destabilized by it. Um, and it is what it is. <laughs> so I kind of want to say to you, first and foremost, with this week, as I often say these days, uh, be very easy with yourself. Be very gentle and loving with yourself. Don't put yourself into overly stressful situations if you can avoid it. Um, and yeah, I also know it's Earth and 2022 and stressful situations abound. So don't add to the work for yourself. If you need to put yourself in time out this week, there's going to be lots of opportunities to do so. And I also want to remind you, as much as some of these events may feel extremely personal, they may not actually be personal. They might just be bringing up stuff for you, but not actually have anything to do with you. So as much as you can sit with yourself and say, yeah, this really hurts and it reminds me of some really deep personal funky shit that I'm trying to deal with. Also, the person across from me who just said that thing might not have any idea what's going on with me, might not you know, recognize that this is something that's hard for me at all, might not have anything to do with me personally. It just might feel super personal. So I just want to say that as kind of a underlining to the rest of the week. I do have some amount of good news. <laughs> it's like four or five minutes worth of good news out of what will probably be a two hour podcast, but you know. <laughs> okay, so let's get back into it. We are again, a waxing half moon in Libra at 14 degrees. And when we're dealing with our waxing half moon in our analogy that we work with every week, we are experiencing a branching moment. Um, the new moon is a seed. The crescent waxing moon is sort of like those first little sprouts that pop up out of the soil and we have to kind of fight against the inertia of the past. And here now at the waxing half, we're growing and we need to start making some decisions about what are we doing with this portion of the process. Um, the moon is square to the sun in the sky. So inherent to this um, phase of the moon is a level of friction. And we kind of have to make a decision about things and choose a direction. Again, very in league with our Letha work that we're doing of determining and claiming. Now, I'm going to kind of just go straight to what Raven Caldera talks about with this moon in their book, Moon Phase Astrology, which I talk about all the time. Love that book. Um, this moon is a moon for the rebellion. This moon is a moon for revolutionaries and for political action. That said, I first and foremost want you to stay safe because we do live in a society, don't we? And there's bigger stuff going on than just this moon phase that's going to last for a few hours. It's happening within a larger context. But all of that being said, uh, Raven Caldera calls this moon the Black Knight's moon. And so what this moon kind of invites us to do, or maybe even, you know, uh, is an indication of us sort of being forced into a role or finding ourselves in a situation where we are kind of taking on the role of the adversary or the thwarter or the one who is willing to garner hatred or garner ire or even resentment by saying the thing that needs to get said but nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> so you might witness some experiences. You might be on the giving end or the receiving end of some situations where somebody is saying stuff that nobody wants to hear, but it totally needs to be said. Um, and the person who is speaking, the person who is, you know, bringing down the truth um, might also be really expecting folks to eventually be grateful that, that, you know, we were willing to be the bad guy and say the thing that nobody wanted to say. And then also right on the heels of that, realizing that no, people are resentful and they may stay resentful. They may, even if they do the work, they may never get to a point where they don't see you or the speaker or the instigator as the bad guy or the person who brought the destabilizing information. 
Um, and if it's us, or, you know, who are walking through this with somebody else, the person who is doing this work might also be thinking, are these people even worth this trouble? Which is a fair question to ask. Um, and that's a very subjective question, right? Our, our answer to that question is going to be very, very subjective. Um, and again, you know, realizing that that folks may stay mad even when they do the work. Um, and all of that experience can make us or whoever it is that we're witnessing go through this really resentful and really bitter about that whole process and thinking to ourselves like, man, this is why I don't stick my neck out for stuff. And so let me put that into the context of our political stuff that's happening around the world. This might be a week where you find yourself having evolved in your political understanding of the past, the present, and the potential futures. And you are now saying a difficult truth to a friend, a coworker, a relative, the person that you drink a beer with at the bar after work. And they are like, man, I don't want to hear any bit of what you're having to say. It's because you're disturbing their paradigm. Um, and it probably needed to be said. And they may never not be mad at you for disturbing their paradigm and destabilizing their worldview. So there's that, right? You know, <laughs> um, but outside of that really uncomfortable stuff, this is also a fantastic moon if it is safe and right for you to be doing this work for political action and speaking truth directly to power. So yes, send the email. Yes, wait on hold to talk to your senator. Yes, let them know what they're doing wrong and what they could be doing correct. And, you know, no donation without legislation has kind of been my vibe. Anytime I'm opening my email and I'm inundated with those donation emails, my answer back immediately as well to mark them as spam. But then right after that is you guys have everything that you should need to get the work done and you're not getting it done. You're not getting anything else out of me until you get some work done and restore my faith as a citizen of this country. That's me. I'm not going to tell you how to act politically in that regard because there's, you know, there's a lot of contention around that stuff. Um, but those types of things are also used against us. And we're going to see that in this week with our astrology as well. Okay. For our lunar body work, when we are dealing with a waxing moon in Libra, we are adorning, awakening, activating, and stimulating, and preparing for action. The hips, our kidneys, which are uh, providing filtration and sending good stuff back to our system, and our bladder. As I say every week, I am not a doctor of the human corpus. I am a doctor of the moon and stars. And uh, if you are wanting to integrate any of the information from this lunar guide into your health routine, check with your trusted health advisor first to make sure that this stuff is safe and right for you. But, and also we can always work with the metaphor. So if it doesn't translate for you on the physical body, perhaps it translates for you in one of your other bodies. And again, with Libra, it's about filtration and, and, and discrimination. Um, and figuring out what is worth keeping. Um, so that stuff, right? Okay. And for our plant body work, just like when the moon is in Virgo, we're not messing with the plants while the moon is in Libra. So it's aesthetics only. Wipe down your plant leaves. Um, check the lighting. Maybe give them a quarter spin so they have more equal growth. Maybe it's a good time to dust the pots or dust your plant stands or any of that kind of stuff. Very appropriate. Okay. Let's now move on to the astrology of this day because it kind of sits with this stuff. We have Venus in Gemini sextile Chiron in Aries at 16 degrees. And, you know, very straightforwardly, what this is giving us is an opportunity to deal with relationship stuff. Now, couple that with what we just said, <laughs> right? A day of, or, you know, a day ish of, you know, being in a place where we need to say it. We might find ourselves as the, the speaker, right? Needing to say something that needs to get said, but nobody wants to hear it. Um, 
Happily, this is a sextile between Venus and Chiron, so they're a little bit more on the same page. Even if there is some friction, even if there are some tough things that need to be said, or some things that need to be said that the other person does not want to hear, we may be a little more inclined to be receptive to that stuff, um, to be on the giving or the receiving end, and to be received as well. Again, when it's Chiron, it feels really personal. And Chiron in Aries is very, very personal. Aries is a very I, me, mine kind of uh, uh, sign, right? So, you know, Chiron hanging out in Aries is like, hey, me, but my pain, my situation, my wound, my my problem. Um, but again, it's a sextile between these two. So both or all parties, hopefully, are a little bit more inclined to sit with each other while some of this tough stuff gets said that needs to be said. Um, and perhaps we or they are going to be a little more receptive to what it is that we're saying. Okay, let's move on to the holy days of July 6th. Okay, I hope your chonies are hiked because we seriously have like a literal buttload of <laughs> festivals and holidays this week. I may not give us as much information on some of these holidays as others because, it, you know, the podcast can run a little long. Sometimes if you are a weekly fan of the podcast, you know that uh, <laughs> I can definitely be a little long winded on things from time to time, even just now in explaining that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, First and foremost, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Canopus. Now, this is a white star located in the keel of the ship, a.k.a. the Argo constellation. Um, this is the second brightest star in the sky, generally speaking, behind the star Sirius that we talked about last week. Um, the traditional name of Canopus is a Latin Latinization of the ancient Greek name Canobos. Its name comes from the mythical uh, Canopus, who was a navigator for Menelaus, the king of Sparta. An earlier source of this name is the Coptic Egyptian Kani or Kahi Nub, which means golden earth. Uh, with a truly alchemical connotation. Um, and that earth stuff is going to come up for us this week. Argo is the ship that carried Jason and the Argonauts in search of the Golden Fleece. So inherent in the symbolism of this star is going on an adventure and fighting hard for something that you really want to achieve. But also we are tapping directly in kind of right here from the word go with our ongoing Gemini slash cancer imagery of maritime uh, action, mariners and the ocean itself. The Hindus call this star Agastya, uh, one of their rishis or inspired sages and the helmsman of their Arga, a son of Varuna, the goddess of the waters. And Sanskrit literature has many allusions to its heliacal rising in connection with certain religious ceremonies. In the Avesta, it is mentioned as pushing the waters forward. So perhaps this star is even thought of as governing the tides. Very, very interwoven with all of that mariner maritime oceanic imagery. In China, this star was referred to as Lao Jin, the old man, and it was an object of worship down to at least 100 uh, BCE. Also on this day from our Slavic friends and ancestors, we have Kupala Night. Uh, Kupala Night is an Eastern Slavic equivalent to St. John's Day and Midsummer celebrations in the rest of the world. Ivan Kupala Day is an ancient Slavic holiday that combines pagan fertility rites with St. John celebrations. As we know, in a lot of places in Eastern Europe, the Catholics rolled in and they were like, here's your new saint. And the Eastern, the Eastern Europeans were like, no, thank you. <laughs> and the Catholics were like, yeah, let's not push on this. Let's just have them do whatever they do. And we'll just call it the Saint Day and leave it at that. <laughs> this combination is reflected in the holiday's name. The word Ivan is a Slavic variant of the name John, while Kupala is a deity 
in the Slavic mythology that embodies the summer solstice. On Cupola Day, young people lit bonfires and jumped over the flames. Girls picked flowers, made wreaths, and floated them on rivers, attempting to see the image of their promised husband in the waters within the wreath. In ancient times, people believed that the eve of Ivan Cupola was the only time of the year when ferns bloom. Now, I have a funny little most aside to that. Uh, reckless young people went into the woods in search of the fern flower, which gives its own supernatural abilities. Side note, ferns don't flower. So it is very likely that this is a euphemism, <laughs> you know for, as we like to say here on the podcast, the sacred knocking of boots. Uh, Ivan Cupola Day celebrations have declined over the years, but neo-pagans, hooray, show a revived interest in this ancient holiday. Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? Oh yeah, the night before is also all about water or, or pranking, and there's a lot of water fights in particular that happen during that time. Uh, this is also, again, another very sacred time for ethically harvesting our herbs uh, that we are going to use throughout the rest of the year. Okay, also on this day, we have the birthday of Tenzin Gyatso from our Buddhist friends and ancestors. This is the 14th Dalai Lama. Most Buddhist holidays are observed according to the lunar calendar. However, there are several exceptions. For example, Tibetan Buddhists celebrate the Dalai Lama's birthday on July 6th uh, versus it being connected to a lunar cycle. Tibetan Buddhism is probably best known for its system of incarnate lamas or spiritual leaders. The Dalai Lama is believed to be the successor in a line of Tulkus, or reincarnations, who are believed to be incarnations of Avalokitsavara, a Buddhisattva embodying the compassion of all Buddhas. Also on this day from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have three different holidays that kind of all overlap each other. We have the Deus Natalis of the Temple of the Two Pales or Pales. Uh, the Pales was, was or were a deity of shepherds, flocks, and livestock. Regarded as male by some sources and female by others, the pales or the pales uh, can be either singular or plural in Latin and refers to at least once a pair of deities. Again, there's our Gemini imagery sort of floating quietly in the background. Also on this day, the Feast of Juno Caprotinia. Uh, the Caprotinia or the Feasts of Juno Caprotina were ancient Roman festivals that were celebrated around this time of year in conjunction with other stuff that's already happened last week and stuff that's coming up next week um, in favor of female slaves and servants. Uh, funky imagery there, but here it is. Uh, during this solemnity, they ran about beating themselves with their fists and with rods. None but women assisted in the sacrifices offered on this day. And then also on this day, we have the day of Estas. Estas is the Roman personification of summer. So if it hasn't come yet, by now, we have officially entered summertime in ancient Rome. All right, July 7th is a Thursday. Our waxing moon is still hanging out in Libra, so we still have lots of opportunities for those super fun and dynamic conversations that we were having the day before. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> there's no astrology of this day, so uh, of note anyways. So, you know, we still have some traces of that um, Venus sextile Chiron lingering in the background. And we have astrology of July 8th kind of looming on the horizon as it were. Um, but generally speaking, no astrology. So let's get directly into the holy days of July 7th. From our Hindu friends and ancestors, starting July 7th and running through the 13th, we have Karchi Puja. Uh, this is a festival that involves the worship of the 14 gods forming the dynasty deity of the Tripuri people. The word Karchi is derived from the word Kya, which means earth. So here is another holiday that's connecting to, or a holiday, I should say, that's connecting to um, that heliacal rising of that fixed star that is bringing focus to the idea of earth, precious earth, golden earth. Karchi Puja is basically done to worship the earth. All of the rituals are of tribal origin and include worshiping the 14 gods and Mother Earth. 
I am leaving out a lot of information about this holiday because there's no time. Unfortunately, check out the Wikipedia page on this. If you are a menstruating person, um, there is a whole preamble to this that witnesses the menstruation cycle of the planet Earth itself. And then this is the, a, a festival ritual uh, complex that comes after that stuff. Uh, check other sources too. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of information there and it's really cool. Okay, from our Islamic friends and ancestors, running from July 7th to the 12th, we have Hajj. The Muslim annual pilgrimage known as the Hajj starts July 7th, and it will be celebrated through July 12th. Uh, the Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam and is a once-in-a-lifetime duty for all able-bodied Muslims to perform if they can afford it. And this is the great pilgrimage to Mecca um, where they uh, gather and do a bunch of really cool ritual and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> um, generally speaking, somewhere in between two and three million people descend on Mecca for this five-day festival. Also on this day, from our Slavic friends and ancestors, we have the marriage of Yarilo and Lada. Um, now, something that we will see continuously focused on throughout the Letha season are sacred marriages, either uh, the reinforcing of marriages and marital state, <laughs> or the blessing or the unification of deities. Um, at, we will see this happening in Beltane, uh, at Lunasad and at Letha. We start to see it at Ostara, but at Ostara, and I've talked about this in other podcasts and in the Letha class, I talk about this as well. Um, at Ostara, those marriages or those sacred unions are very, very symbolic. And they often are between like the plant world and the animal world or just between animals. Or if humans are involved, it's usually kids and it's or the youth. And it's very symbolic. In, it, in its energy and its sim and its symbolism. Um, but once we step into Beltane, it matures, it grows up, and we're actually talking about real erotic and physical union between the deities or us human beings or whomever. Um, Letha brings it back to the symbolic again. And then at Lunasad will be kind of the last of the more physically erotic moments of these things. Um, Yarilo and Lada are both springtime deities. And uh, Yarilo is a vegetation god. Lada is a sun goddess. And uh, they both are very focused on fertility and abundance but they both will also turn into other deities around this time. And so this is sort of a, a, a speaking to something that a lot of modern Wiccans work with, that idea that I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the podcast of our spring maiden version of the goddess evolving into the summertime mother version of the goddess this is reflected in uh, Yarilo and Lada also changing shape at this time of year. From our Japanese friends and ancestors, we have the Festival of Tanabata. This is also known as the Star Festival, and it takes place on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year, by some lunar calendars, when, according to a Chinese legend, the two stars Altair and Vega, which are usually separated from each other by the Milky Way, are able to meet again, a sacred symbolic marriage. One popular Tanabata custom is to write one's wishes on a piece of paper and hang that piece of paper on a specially erected bamboo tree in the hope that wishes come true. And I think we need to get as many wishes in the air as humanly possible right now. So I'm very in favor of this particular festival. Uh, and last but not least for this day, from our Roman friends and ancestors, we have the Vitulatio. The Vitulatio was an annual Thanksgiving celebration in ancient Rome. The verb vitulari or vitulari meant to chant or recite a formula with a joyful intonation and rhythm. A goddess, vitula, possibly an invention to explain the name, embodied joy or life, vitae, uh, vitality. Um, and again, we know that that's one of our big themes that we're focusing on at this time of year is life and vitality. All right, July 8th is a Friday and uh, our waxing moon enters Scorpio. Okay. <laughs> All right, so look. <laughs> 
listen, listen, listen. <laughs> um, the general advice on this day for this lunar phase, I should say, is around considering power dynamics. And again, referring to Raven Caldera, uh, their advice on this moon um, is to consider where uh, our own tendencies and behaviors that fall under the umbrella of revenge can get kind of stirred up. And that might make a lot of sense, especially after the really spicy conversations that you might have had for the last couple of days with the moon traveling through Libra and our other astrology that's like, hey, let's say stuff that nobody wants to hear and see what happens, right? And so now if somebody has said some things to you and destabilized you, or if maybe you said some things and destabilized somebody else, there might be a resentment thing right now and somebody wants to get back or we might want to get back at people. We might feel like we um, need to lash out at power structures as well. Um, on this day, and I'm going to kind of skip around here a little bit and talk about the astrology on this day that we also have the sun in cancer square Chiron in Aries, and we have Mercury in cancer squaring Jupiter in Aries, uh, sun Chiron at 16 degrees, Mercury and Jupiter at eight degrees. And both of these, all of these things feel like, ouch, they feel like um, feeling trapped, feeling super defensive, feeling victimized. Um, we might be really eager to jump to conclusions on this day, um, all of that stuff. So again, this is one of those days where I'm going to encourage you to take care of yourself, be gentle with yourself. Uh, put yourself in time out if you need to. If you can avoid a stressful situation on this day, it might be the, the path of peace is what is recommended here. Um, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And there might also be an urge in us at the same time to go get right up in the face of the thing or the person that we feel is agitating us and give them a what for, right? Like enact our revenge or or show them, you know, I'm not the one to mess with, or this is the situation that you shouldn't have messed with. And I'm not going to tell you how to live, but uh, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> like, don't we all have enough trauma and drama on our plate as it is? Do we really need to evoke more from our situation and our universe? Of course, I'm always going to stand behind you and, and, uh, or beside you really, and encourage you to speak truth to power, um, to, you know, knock back down, um, if somebody is doing something wrong to you and needs to hear the truth and you're the one to say it, then go for it. But again, with Chiron all up in the mix, it can feel extremely personal. It can feel extremely like I'm being attacked by the universe. This whole situation is coming to get me. And again, remembering that we've got Mercury square Jupiter in the background, really encouraging us to jump to conclusions. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, when we have that chironic influence and it feels so, so, so personal, it can be really difficult to see through the haze of that and to understand I'm having a personal experience, but this situation is not necessarily about me. It's just happening. And that is really difficult to keep those things separate. So just I'm with you in this. <laughs> I have a variety of stressful experiences happening on July 8th. And I was like, well, look at that astrology. I hate astrology forever now. This is stupid. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> so, but, and, um, you know, if, if that's the work that presents itself, okay, good luck you know, do it in a, in as much of a form as is healthy and safe for you and back away from it when it's like, this is too much. I'm done. But also, but, and also I want you to think about where you have been taught to cling to something that is actually bad for you because you have been taught that the alternative is worse. Is it? Where do we insert justification for terrible things because we are afraid of the road not taken? This is a day, again, that can feel very, very personal in its effects. But if we can come outside of that experience a little bit and witness 
where is it that these power structures are really pushing me to act in a certain way or move in a certain way or be in a certain place because they're holding up the specter of, oh, look at how much worse it could be if you take the road not taken or the road less traveled. So that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, it's, it's a little crunchy this week. <laughs> it's a little crunchy. If I had the option to dip this week's astrology in milk and soften it up a bit first, I totally would, but I don't know that we're going to be given the option this week. So just be as kind with yourself as you possibly can. If these types of super tough situations are presenting themselves for you. For our lunar body work, when we are dealing with a waxing moon in Scorpio, we are awakening, activating, adorning, stimulating, preparing for action. The organs and the processes of pleasure, reproduction, and waste management. Yeah, I know. It's pretty pointed, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty pointed. It's all about sex and death when the moon is moving through Scorpio. Um and, you know, Scorpio is ruled by Pluto. And so those power dynamics are very, very clear for those of us living in the U.S., but really in the West, because it's not just the United States government that's acting out of pocket right now. There's a variety of Western governments that are just going ham currently. Things are going off in the Netherlands. Things are going off in Canada. It's it's happening. Um, so, you know, the astrology is like, hey, here we are. <laughs> here we are. Uh, for our plant body work, we are planting, transplanting, and grafting our annual flowers and fruits and veg that bear crops above ground, like corn, tomatoes, watermelon, zucchini, beans, what have you. Um, this is a great time for uh, fortifying your plants that are producing things above the soil. And again, Sun in Cancer, square Chiron in Aries, Mercury in Cancer, square Jupiter in Aries feels super personal. Um, we can feel really like closed in by our circumstances. So what I recommend for this stuff is a, let me say this, the sun square Chiron is happening at like six 30 in the morning, Pacific standard time. And then, uh, the Mar, excuse me, Mercury square Jupiter is much later in the day. It's 11 o'clock at night, Pacific, Pacific time. Um, if we're seeing this stuff play out in the world, this might be a lot of seeing people struggle against their sacred wound. Um, we might be seeing some really wild information come to the surface, but that information might be disinformation. So we might be really getting hit with propaganda on this day. Think about again, our lunar work of like, where have you been taught to believe a thing or to buy into a thing? Because you've been taught that the, the alternative is even worse. And can we make some space to question that today? Um, if anything is here to help us be anytime we're dealing with Chiron, it's a great time for therapy. So it's a great time for therapy, group therapy, talk therapy, anything, even if it's just like doing body therapy and working with your vagus nerve or whatever it is to kind of cool the fight flight responses as this stuff is coming at us. Um, ground in yourself and come into your personhood um, and put your feet on the ground and breathe into the space that you are in, in that moment. Um, and, you know, the help that we can get from Mercury square Jupiter uh, can be a really fantastic day uh, to get professional stuff done. We might be feeling super duper confident on this day, despite all of this wild stuff that's going on, especially if we're just seeing it in the world and not seeing it, play out in our personal lives. Um, I would just say just Mercury plus Jupiter can be really super uh, optimistic about everything and be like, yeah, it's fantastic. So just like go over the fine print a few times before you sign the contract or, you know, have somebody else read the email. If it's that important, you know, triple check everything, like double check all of your work um, before you put it out into the world on this day. Okay. Let's get into the holy days of July 8th. Okie dokie, from our Celtic and Druid friends and ancestors, July 8th through August 4th is our tree month of holly. Uh, bearing witness to the holly king, taking over the what will become the dark half of the year. <laughs> holly is an evergreen plant and reminds us of the immortality in nature. 
Celts saw this plant as a symbol of firmness, toughness, solar power, and protection. The wood was used for weapons, and a sprig of holly in the house ensures good luck and safety. You can also wear it as a charm. You can also make holly water by soaking holly leaves in water and charging it under the upcoming full moon, which is uh, at the end of this week, actually. <laughs> um, use the water to bless people and your home for protection and for cleansing, but do not use this with pets. It can be toxic for pets, so don't put this in places where your pets are going to encounter it, like I wouldn't use it as a floor wash, for example. Okay. Also on this day from our Islamic friends and ancestors, running from July 8th to the 9th, we have Waq al-Arafa. Uh, this day commemorates the final sermon of Muhammad, which the prophet gave in his final year of life. It's the second day of the Hajj, which is, of course, as we talked about, the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. From our Norwegian friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Suniva, uh, this is a Suniva feast day in Norway, and currently Suniva is referred to as Saint Suniva. She is a patroness saint of uh, Bjorgmin, one of the dioceses that makes up the Church of Norway, as well as all of Western Norway. But of course, Suniva is actually the sun personified. Um, the name Suniva is used to refer to the solar goddess in German mythology. Um and what I think is really interesting is one of the two Merseburg incantations uh, recorded in Old High German is a horse cure, mentioning Suna or Suniva with her sisters singing chants over Baldur's wounded horse and curing it. Scholars have proposed that Sol, as a goddess, may represent an extension of an earlier Proto-Indo-European deity due to Indo-European linguistic connections between the Norse Sol, the Sanskrit Surya, the common Britonic Sulis, Lithuanian Sole, Latin Sol, and the Slavic Tsar Solnitsa. So all of these solar goddesses being worshipped through the Feast of Suniva. And also on this day, from our Yoruban friends and ancestors, we have the Feast of Elegba Bara. Um, Elegba or Elegba is also Elegwa, Legba. Uh, this is the road opener. Um, Elegba holds all of the paths or roads as well as crossroads. And he holds the keys to the past, the present, and the future. He is the first deity mentioned or worshipped in any ritual um, and is often used to open the ritual uh, you know, moment for the rest of the day or rest of the evening. And he holds the keys to all destinies. Um, in that, Hecate actually, you know, carries a lot of the symbolism of Elegba in being a deity of the crossroads and known for carrying her keys. But also remember, we have our solar cross symbol for Letha, which is a wheel with an equal armed cross in it, aka crossroads. So <laughs> interesting. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Alrighty, July 9th is a Saturday. We still have our waxing moon hanging out in Scorpio. Uh, we have no astrology of note this day. I think we have had plenty of astrology from the day before, so let's just kind of like have any amount of nice time. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and we only have a couple of holy days for this day, so let's just get right into it. Uh, from July 9th to the 10th, we have Eid al Adha from our Islamic friends and ancestors. This is the Feast of the Sacrifice or the Greater Eid. Um, and this is sort of the beginning of the end of the Hajj. Um, and this is uh, one of the most significant festivals in Islam. This holiday is related to a biblical story known in Islamic tradition as the Binding of Ishmael. The story narrates that Allah required Ibrahim to sacrifice his only son, Ishmael, as an act of submission to a command from God. Ibrahim was willing to make the sacrifice, but at the last moment, Allah intervened and provide, provided Ibrahim with a lamb to sacrifice instead. The observance begins with a special Eid prayer after the pilgrims performing the Hajj descend from Mount Arafat near Mecca. Muslims are expected to dress in their finest clothes before going to the mosque to pray. 
Those who can afford to sacrifice their best halal domestic animals as a sacrifice, as, excuse me, as a symbol of Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice Ishmael. The choice of sacrificed animal depends on the region, but usually it's a cow or a lamb. And the meat is traditionally divided into three parts. The family keeps one part and the other two are donated to relatives or friends and neighbors and the poor and the needy. So built into this holiday is an awareness of community and charity. On this day, it's customary to gather with family and friends, have celebratory meals, and give Eidi, or special gifts. Eid gifts are most often given to children as a token of love. And also on this day, from our Latvian friends and ancestors, we have Sea and Fisherman's Fest. Uh, the Sea and Fisherman's Festival is held in Latvian coastal towns and villages on the second weekend in July. It is the country's second largest summer festival after Yanni, the Midsummer's Day, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, celebrated on June 24th. But during this week, and I'm not going to get into all of them because we have so much, uh, we are also seeing maritime festivals, festivals honoring fishermen, maritime uh, industries and mariners themselves, as well as the ocean itself um, in Russia, China, and Tajikistan. So, you know, and we've had some in the last couple of weeks, and we're going to have more in the next couple of weeks, but then they're going to start to taper off as we move into um, Lunasa season. All right. Whew. <laughs> Let us move on to July 10th. But before that, how about an ad? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, if you love this podcast, you can support this work through Patreon. Thank you a bajillion billion times. See, the, the sirens are going off even as I say it. Um, thank you so, so much to my patrons. Um, you guys don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know. Thank you so much. Uh, you can sub for as little as a dollar if you just think this podcast is dope and you want to support it. Uh, I don't run ads on the podcast, um, partly because I don't want to and partly because I won't get paid even if I do. Uh, so screw them, man. Um, you can sub, as I said, for as little as a buck or $5, even if you want to just support the podcast. And this is plenty of information. But if you want even more information, um, you know, extra podcasts, extra videos, extra information about the Wheel of the Year, magical practices, tarot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, subbing at the higher levels, you get all kinds of cool free stuff. And at the even higher levels, uh, you get free readings every month with me um, to be able to integrate all of this information into your personal life based on what's going on in your natal chart and all of that other good stuff. Join and change your life forever. Or, you know, whatever. Thanks so much for the support. If you can't support financially, I completely understand because life sucks on earth right now. It's too expensive for everything. Um, tell a friend, share it on social media, uh, give it a thumbs up. If you're feeling especially hedonistic, you can leave a rating or a review. All right. That's the end of the ad. Let's get back to the podcast. <laughs> Welcome back. Okay. Uh, July 10th is a Sunday and we see our gibbous moon moving into Sagittarius. It will be gibbous at three degrees of Sagittarius, 7.02 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, later in the day for everybody else around the planet. And this moon is in a wide trine to Jupiter and Neptune. So it's vaguely influenced by a trine to Jupiter and Neptune. Neptune bringing in a little dreaminess, maybe a little fogginess. Jupiter really wanting to amp up the Sagittarius vibes in general. Um, and it's going to sit actually pretty nicely with some of the astrology that we have for this day, which is, I'm bouncing around again, why not? Um, the sun in Cancer sextile Uranus in Taurus at 18 degrees. And very briefly, um, this sun sextile Uranus can feel incredibly energizing, 
um, revitalizing after, you know, a lot of the heaviness that we have worked through um, the week so far, right? It's only been a few days and it's already like, whoo, I can't take it. <laughs> um, sun sextile Uranus can feel very exciting a very electrifying and very unnerving. Um, and we may be feeling really unstoppable on this day. And again, that's a nice turn in our astrology uh, compared to a lot of the heaviness that we are facing in the week. Also a gibbous moon in Sag, generally speaking, especially trine Jupiter, the planetary ruler of Sagittarius, can feel pretty dang optimistic, pretty dang positive about stuff. Um, but here is some of the work that we can do with this gibbous moon in Sagittarius. We are encouraged to study the past. And I want you to think about this in conjunction with the conversation that we were having with Moon and Libra and the conversations that we were having with Moon and Scorpio. This Moon and Sagittarius is looking at studying the past and particularly events and history and information that is used to justify current events. Ooh, right? So as, as we always want to, when it comes to Sagittarius, follow the rabbit down the hole, like let your studies take you where they go. Try not to study with so much of an agenda as just an open, how far is the horizon? Let me see if I can find it. Um, you know, as, as is safe and healthy for you, as I always say, right? Um, but I feel like the trine from Jupiter and the sextile between the sun and Uranus on this day are a bit uplifting. So if we are in a place of like recovery from the moon Libra, moon Scorpio work, Sagittarius moon here can be like, yeah, I know that was some really dark shit that we just went through, but let's push into where it came from. I have the capacity for that right now. If you don't, you don't. But if you do, this is something to do with that energy and your time on this day. But also, it's probably going to be a beautiful Sunday. Just go fucking enjoy yourself. <laughs> That's completely fine, too. <laughs> when we have our waxing moon in Sagittarius for our lunar body work, we are adorning and stimulating and activating and awakening and preparing for action the lower back, the sciatic nerve family, and our thighs in general. So yes, as the great Saint Lizzo has prepared our generation to understand, thick thighs do in fact save lives. Uh, this is a day for celebrating that business. Um, and again, if the body, the physical metaphor doesn't work with you, you can work with that metaphor in any of your other bodies, your emotional, spiritual, psychological, what have you. For our plant work on this day, we are harvesting, we're doing pest control, disease control, we're plowing, we're weeding, or we are aerating the soil and we are pruning our plants to encourage above soil growth. Again, as I've mentioned several times, Letha season is our most potent time for doing our plant harvesting for plants that we are going to work with throughout the rest of the year ethical harvesting, of course, um, you know, harvesting invasive species first and foremost, because there's probably plenty of it, <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, getting in there and, and getting that kind of work done. Okay. Moving on to the holy days of July 10th, we only have two technically, and they're both heliacal risings. We don't actually have any other festival days on this day, and that's kind of a rarity, so enjoy. This truly can be a day all just for you. Wild, because Sagittarius and, and Jupiter are very dedicated to the gods, right? They're very about the gods. Um, but let's talk about it. Okay, so we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Propus. Um, this is a small star situated between the, so the shoulders of the twins, uh, Gemini, the Gemini constellation. The traditional name Propus is from a Latin word that implies close. It symbolizes companionship, friendship, um, and it is clearly influenced by either Greek or Babylonian mythology. Um, Astrology King, uh, who I love for his or their information about fixed stars, um, says this, we should read into this star, the qualities of cooperation of 
two heads being better than one and of associative thinking. So this is another day where therapy, group therapy, getting together with friends to celebrate and enjoy and revitalize and re-energize each other could be really magical work and maybe, you know, something that's worth more than the sum of the parts. You know what I'm saying? That thing. Okay. Also on this day, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star. What's that? What's that? I am sorry, that was terrible, but I couldn't help it. Uh, <laughs> Wasat is on the right elbow of Castor, the northern twin of the Gemini constellation. The traditional name Wasat comes from the Arabic Al Wasat, which means the middle. And as just a side note, Pluto was discovered conjunct Wasat, this fixed star, back in 1930. Alrighty, July 11th is a Monday, as I say every week. Sorry, there's nothing I can do about it. The seven days, they just come in a row. It is what it is. Okay. <laughs> we still have our waxing moon hanging out in Sagittarius. So we are still doing that hopefully optimistic oriented um, research on stuff from the past that is being used to justify actions in the present. Um, and as I always say, you know, you take what works for you and leave what doesn't. If anything about this week is like, that's too much for me, then that's too much for you. Don't worry about it. We can do that work another time. Uh, there is no astrology of note for this day. Let me turn the page of my book and make sure that that's true. Ooh, wasn't that a satisfying page turn? Uh, ASMR for you guys. There you go. No, there's no astrology of note for this day. So let me get directly into the holy days of July 11th. We have a few. So <laughs> just a few, uh, running from, uh, July 11th to the 18th. This is a global awareness day. Uh, this is non-binary awareness week, July, uh, 11th through 18th. This date was chosen for being precisely between international men's day and international women's day. <laughs> uh, this is the week, um, uh, focused on, uh, this is L, excuse me, this is a week focused on LGBTQ plus awareness, um, dedicated to those who do not fit within the traditional gender binary, i.e. those who do not exclusively identify as a man or a woman who may identify as both a man or a woman, or may fall outside of these categories altogether. We love our non-binary community friends. You guys are cute. All right. Also on this day from our Hindu friends and ancestors, running from July 11th to the 16th, we have Jaya Parvati Puja. Uh, Jaya Parvati Puja is a five-day women's festival celebrating Jaya, an avatar of Parvati, who is the goddess of fertility, love, beauty, harmony, marriage, children, and devotion, as well as of divine strength and power. She's known by many other names, um, she's gentle and nurturing um, and is a form of the supreme goddess and one of the central deities in the goddess-oriented Shakti sect called Shaktism. She is the mother goddess in Hinduism. So lots of emphasis on mother goddess imagery, not just this week, but throughout cancer season, which is Letha season. Um, this festival is for unmarried women looking for a partner and for married women to give prayers for health and protection and long life for their partner. Um, and while we certainly could dive deep into problematic elements of this, I'm not going to, um, what I am going to point to is here is another holiday focusing on the sanctity of, I don't want to say the word sanctity. That's not at all what I mean here. The sacredness of uh, marriage at this time of year and sacred unions being really at the forefront. That's what I want to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, running from July 11th through the 13th, from our Mongolian friends and ancestors, we have Nadam. Nadam is a traditional three-day midsummer celebration, which is celebrated as a public holiday. It was included in the UNESCO representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity festivals, uh, which is something that UNESCO is doing around the world really cool, actually. Um, and this festival includes a bunch of really cool stuff, but specifically three sporting competitions, archery, 
horse racing, and Mongolian wrestling, collectively known as the three games of men or the three manly skills. But recently, women have started to participate in the horse racing and the archery games. Uh, the opening ceremony includes athletes, horse riders, dancers, and musicians. And this ceremony um, is followed by competitions that last for the next three days. Also on this day, from our Catholic friends and ancestors, we have this the Feast of St. Benedict. Um, there's a lot I could say about St. Benedict, but I'm not going to. This is what I'm going to say. St. Benedict has a whole lot of Virgo vibes about them. They lived in a cave. God is blessed. We could all live in a cave. Um, wrote the Rule of St. Benedict, a smash hit. Uh, <laughs> but what I think is very interesting is that his medal is a circle with an equal armed cross in the middle, which is our solar wheel and our crossroads symbolism. So, hmm, okay. Also on this day from our Greek friends and ancestors, we have the festival of Cronia. Let's get into it. Uh, Cronia was an Athenian festival held in honor of Kronos. In nearly all fields and towns, they happily feast upon the banquets, said some writer back in the day, and everyone waits upon his own servants. Slaves and the free, rich and poor, all dined together and played games. Um, Kronos was the leader and the youngest of the first generation of Titans, the divine descendants of the primordial Gaia, Mother Earth, tying in here, and Uranus, Father Sky. He, Kronos, overthrew his father and ruled during the mythological Golden Age until he was overthrown by his own son, Zeus, and imprisoned in Tartarus in a cave, in the cave of Nyx. Now, Kronos uh, was usually depicted with a harp or a scythe or a sickle, which was the instrument he used to castrate and depose Uranus, his father. Um... This festival celebrates the harvest, suggesting that as a result of his association, Kronos' association with the virtuous golden age, Kronos continued to preside as a patron of the harvest. Kronos was identified in classical antiquity with the Roman deity Saturn. Kronos was said to be the father of the wise centaur Chiron. Come on, really? Yeah. <laughs> Like, cool, but geez, right? <laughs> In some accounts, Kronos was also called the father of the Corybantes. And we don't have time to talk about the incredibly dope and fantastic Corybantes. But if you would like to know more about these wild ass priestesses, uh, go read my piece about Kybel that I have on my site that you will find within the information on Ostara. In Greco-Roman Egypt, Kronos was equated with the Egyptian god Geb because he held a similar position in Egyptian mythology as the father of the gods Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys, as Kronos did in the Greek pantheon. Now, during antiquity, Kronos was occasionally interpreted as Kronos. So when I'm saying Kronos the god, we're thinking K-R-O-N-U-S or C-R-O-N-U-S. But now we're talking about the word or the deity Kronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S, the personification of time. The Greek name Kronos is synonymous to Kronos, time, since he maintains the course and cycles of the seasons and the periods of time, whereas the Latin name Saturn denotes that he is saturated with years since he was devouring his sons, which implies that time devours the ages. Rhea and Kronos, brother and sister, were given, uh, were, were given names of streams. Rhea means river, stream, or flux, and Kronos means time. So we also have the river of time sort of embedded in all of this symbolism. Another analysis of Kronos says that the one cause of all things is Kronos or time. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to unpack here. And I have a little bit more to say about this, but um, this symbol of this time deity that oversees the turning of the seasons really sort of comes to the rise here as we move through the last part of Letha season and into Lunasad season. The idea of a Saturnine type figure walking through the fields of grain with this massive sickle um, and sort of, you know, naming the moment, as it were, when 
uh, one cycle ends and another cycle begins. Really, really potent stuff here. But let me give you this too. Let me say that. Let me, let me give you this and let me give you this. Let's pull it back for a second and talk about the fact that Kronos is said to be the father of Chiron. You know, again, we have all this Chironic energy this week. So it's like, holy moly. Um, but Chiron represents our sacred wound. And one of the ways that I translate that when I'm doing astrology with people is that our sacred wound is equatable to our personal wisdom, the wisdom that we have earned through the shit that we have been through. Um, not that we deserved to go through those things or that we needed to go through those things to learn those lessons, but we went through them and subsequently we have learned these things, right? And one of the things that I often say about that is that those are things that take time to evolve and to reveal themselves, right? We have a traumatic event. Um, we have, we're abandoned or we're betrayed, or we have some other incredibly painful experience. And it is a, of course, going to take time for us to be able to deal with it and find its place in our life. But also it takes time for us to glean the wisdom that might be held in those events. Um, those are things that just, they take time. Okay. But let me say this as well. In addition to the name, the story of Kronos eating his children was also interpreted as an allegory to a specific aspect of time held within Kronos' sphere of influence. As the theory went, Kronos represented the destructive ravages of time, which devoured all things, a concept that was illustrated when the Titan King ate the Olympian gods. The past consuming the future, older generations suppressing the next generations. Do we have any of that going on right now on earth? I don't know. Do we? Let me check in. Leave a comment below if you can think of any, any old thing that's happening on the planet right now where the past is trying to devour the future. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Alrighty, we've made it to the end of the lunar week. Good job, everybody. Uh, July 12th is a Tuesday, and we find our waxing moon entering Capricorn. This is officially the full moon pre-funk. Um, so, you know, do what you need to do to get ready for the full moon. Um, is there going to be a little spicy business on the full moon? <laughs> of course there is. What do you think you're getting out of this alive? No, no, I don't think so. Uh <laughs> Um, so let's, let's talk about it, right? Cause that's what we're here to do. Uh, first off, we're going to switch gears a little bit on this day. Um, what we want to be focusing on with this, uh, Capricorn moon in this particular lunar phase is, uh, we want to work on our craft or we want to do labor for the group. And when you offer your labor or your work to the group, Ask for what you are worth. This is a reasonable moon to appraise your work and ask for a raise, but skipping around a little bit again, on this day we have the sun in Cancer sextile the North Node in Taurus um, at 20 degrees, and there can be uh, some co-worker drama with that. There can be some focus on like long standing patterns in those places. So, you know, your mileage may vary on whether today is actually the best day to ask for the raise versus whether it's a day to just appraise where it is that you are in your work. And, you know, where were you six months ago? Where are you now? Have you been asked to take on a whole bunch more duties, but you haven't been compensated for that? Perhaps it's the time to kind of get your ducks in a row on that subject matter. But let me get into this a little bit deeper. Um, the deeper work here is to understand what you bring to the table. One. Two, bring it. Three, get what you need. Okay. Um, a quote from M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled, a metaphor I was using earlier in the podcast, is this. Until you value yourself, you won't value your time. And until you value your time, you're not going to do anything with it. And this sits very tightly with our Letha season work in general, which is a lot of coming into understanding that you are in fact a badass, that you are in fact 
a powerful person with amazing skill sets. And you're here, you know, first and foremost for your own pleasure and harmony and loveliness, but secondly, to help the group. (laughs) <laughs> and to assist with the work that needs to get done to to get the collective forward to the next thing. And so that work starts with valuing yourself. When I talk about in uh, our Letha class, stepping into your power, I was saying this before, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing around stepping into your power is claiming what you're doing, but it's not the first work that we do. The first work that we do in stepping into our power is taking responsibility for ourselves in caring for ourselves. Because if we have not filled our cup, we can't pour it out for other people. And this quote here and this idea of this waxing moon in Capricorn is this same thing. You have to understand what you are and what you have and learn to appreciate it before you're really going to step into utilizing it for your best benefit and for the best benefit of the people that are around you. Just that, right? No big deal. No no pressure there, especially after this really super fun week of like lots of hard conversations and diving into like power structures that are manipulating us into doing this, that, and the other thing, right? Here we come on the very end of it. But I feel like, you know, that work could be really hard, but fortifying, especially when it comes to the, the conclusion of Capricorn moon saying, Hey, do you get it now that you're hardcore? Do you get it now that you're a badass? Do you get it now that you have these incredible skill sets and you are an amazing person? And also everybody will be benefited when you share that. And also you absolutely deserve to be compensated for the incredible things that you bring to the group, all of this stuff. Um, So that, that stuff. Okay. When we have our moon waxing in Capricorn for our lunar body work, we are adorning, stimulating, preparing for action, the bones, the hair, the nails, the teeth. So you better goddamn believe it. The Manny Petty is a holy act this week. Uh, the deep conditioner that we leave on for an hour, that's a holy act this week. The $80 bottle of lotion, that's a holy act this week. <laughs> <laughs> the bling having some diamonds and some 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 bling added to the teeth that's a holy act this week 100 percent. do it do it <laughs> um and for our plant body work we are maintaining our containers our borders our fences our gardening beds our structures so if you have outdoor areas and you have a fence this is a great time to go mend your fence and check your boundaries check your borders um if you have a plant that is in a pot that and the pot is failing this is a great week for transplanting it and repairing that pot or putting it into a pot that is better suited for that plant Um, Okay, so let's come back to the astrology of this day. We have Sun in Cancer, sextile the North Node in Taurus at 20 degrees. We have Mercury in Cancer, square Chiron in Aries at 16 degrees. Yeah, more Chiron. I told you. And we have Venus in Gemini, trine Saturn retrograde in Aquarius at 24 degrees. And what do I want to say about this stuff? Like I said, with um, Sun sextile North Node, there can be stress and bizarre stuff that comes up at work, coworker drama. It might just be things that you are witnessing, um, or it might be something that you're experiencing. If you've got planets near these degrees, um, especially in any of the fixed signs, um, or I guess, uh, or the cardinal signs too, (laughs) for that matter. Um, but what really might be coming out are, um, you know, patterns and systems that, that are long standing and that need to be addressed and need to be rectified in some way. Again, today might not be the day that we do that work. It might be the day that we're gathering information and kind of getting our ducks in a row, getting our evidence (laughs) collected on, on that stuff. Um, With Mercury squaring Chiron, you know, it's uh, it's tough. This is a day where I'm going to say, if you need mental health support, go get it. Um, again, group therapy, um, doing your five, four, three, two, one check-ins, uh, grounding yourself in the present moment, remembering to tell your brain, Hey, it's okay. We don't have to solve it all right now. <laughs> uh, checking around and making sure that you are not in physical danger and trying to transmit that 
that message to your body and to your mind. Like we're okay in this moment. Everything's okay. But Mercury square Chiron is mental stress. It's mental anguish. It's mental pain. So again, if you need to put yourself in timeout, go for a walk, do some deep breathing, take care of yourself if you need to. And I've, and I've said this a lot in this season, but it really is the truth kind of with a lot of the astrology throughout this year. If you need to ramp it back a little bit, if you need to downshift or downgrade what you're doing, take a couple of events off the calendar, simplify your offerings to the world, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> but also here to help us is this Venus trine Saturn. And yeah, I know it's Saturn. So also here's some Saturn stuff, right? Um, but this could really bring some stabilization to those conversations that started at the beginning of the week with the moon and Libra, where it was like, whoa, this is a spicy convo. We're saying things that people don't want to hear. People are telling us things that we don't want to hear. Um, uh, this Venus trying Saturn is like, okay, I can, I can actually hear this now. Um, I understand where you're coming from. Let's continue with this conversation. I needed to take a couple days off, but now I'm back. Um, can we continue with that conversation, please? And it can feel um, much more stable and much more productive. Um, and again, Venus, right? These are our love relationships um, and they deserve this kind of time and effort. Um, so yeah, give it to him if you can. All right. Holy days for July 12th. We just have a few, uh, starting us off. We have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Castor, as in yes, Castor and Pollux. Yes. Gemini. Wait, what? We're most of the way through cancer season in Western astrology, in sidereal astrology. We are just making our way through Gemini <laughs> as we talk about quite often. Um, this is a complex uh, multiple star system made up of six individual stars that just all look like they are one star located in the head of the northern twin of the Gemini constellation. Castor and Pollux were the two gods of Sparta in Greece. Remember at the beginning of the week that we dealt with um, whoever it was, Canopus, the, the star connected to the um, navigator for King Menelaus, king of Sparta? Um, so these are the two gods of Sparta and Greece. Uh, they were the sons of Leda, the queen of Sparta. Um, they were the D the Greek Dioscuri, the Didymi, the Roman Gemini or Gemini. Uh, their Roman equivalents are Apollo and Hercules. Pollux or Hercules comes from the Greek Polyutux. Uh, hence, he was the boxer, which I love it because it sounds like... Um, Put up your dukes, Polyuk dukes. <laughs> Pollux was the immortal twin and a skilled horseman. Castor was the mortal twin, famous for his skill in taming and managing horses. When Castor was killed in battle, Pollux asked his father, Zeus, aka Jupiter, that he die to forever be with Castor. Zeus killed Pollux with a bolt of lightning and placed the twins in heaven as the constellation of Gemini. And for those who have been following along with the channel, um, you'll know or you'll remember that lightning at the top of the masts of ships were referred to as Leda or Castor and Pollux. Um, in India, they are Aquini or the Ashwins or the horsemen. So again, the horse imagery abounds through this season. Running from July 12th through August 23rd, we have the Delta Aquarids meteor showers. Um, this is a pretty good meteor shower, and the peak of it falls around July 29th every year. And this year, we are lucking out because we are having a new moon on July 28th. So um, it is going to be a fantastic time for um, star watching. If you have any chance to get out of uh, and out of the city or away from your or nearby light pollution and go stare at the stars all night. This is a fantastic meteor shower for doing just that. And from our Hopi friends and ancestors, we have the Niman Kachina dances. This is in accordance with the Hopi calendar. Uh, Niman takes place shortly after the summer solstice as we move from Kachina season to non Kachina season. This is also called the going home of the Kachinas. Niman is a ceremony to say goodbye to the winter and spring Kachimas, Kachinas. Excuse me. During this beautiful last ceremony of the Kachina season, 
Katsinam bring the first harvest of the season to the villagers as well as presents for the children. This festival includes feasting and a ceremonial performance by masked dancers representing the Ketsinam who are now leaving the village to return to the spirit world in the San Francisco peaks for the rest of the year. Dancers carry musical instruments, the first green corn stalks of the harvest, and sacred meal, which is sprinkled on the katsinam as a thank you for the summer harvest to come. Priests carry a water bowl and a ceremonial pipe. Smoke from the pipe symbolizes clouds, and water from the bowl is flung with a feather, symbolizing the rain that will nourish the crops. And that, my friends, is our Lunar Week let's head into the roundup. All right, if you didn't notice, let me point out to you that our lunar phases move from the sign of Libra to the sign of Capricorn. These are cardinal signs and they are still helping us open up and initiate the big over season of summer itself. For our astrology this week, Wednesday the 6th, we have our waxing half moon in Libra. We also have Venus in Gemini, sextile Chiron in Aries at 16 degrees. Skipping to Friday the 8th, we have our moon in Scorpio. We have the sun in Cancer, square Chiron in Aries at 16 degrees. And we also have Mercury in Cancer, square Air, uh, Jupiter in Aries at 8 degrees. Uh, skipping to the 10th, we have our moon entering Sagittarius. That's our gibbous moon. We have the sun in Cancer, sextile Uranus in Taurus at 18 degrees. And then on Monday the 11th, no, nothing. I'm full of lies. Uh, the 12th, we have the moon moving into Capricorn. And then we have the sun in Cancer, sextile the North Node in Taurus at 20 degrees. We have Mercury in Cancer, square Chiron in Aries at 16 degrees. And Venus in Gemini, trine Saturn retrograde in Aquarius at 24 degrees. Thanks for so, thank you so much for being with me this week um, and all the weeks. Um Again, uh, you know, I've said it a million times in this in this recording, but I, I do really want to stress, like, be gentle with yourself this week. There are so many opportunities to have something happen that hits you in a very, very personal way, whether it actually has anything to do with you or not. And that type of stuff can push us into a place where we feel very defensive. We feel like we need to be on the offensive, and especially with that um, lunar work that we're doing right in the middle of the week with the moon passing through Scorpio, we may feel a whole lot of urgency around getting revenge or getting one up on a situation or attacking before something has a chance to attack us. And that might not be the move at all. So I just really encourage you to guard your energy this week, ground yourself when you are feeling out of sorts and destabilized, understanding that you may be having a really intense personal experience in a situation that has nothing to do with you personally. Um, But that also a lot of the stuff that's happening in our country is a personal attack and it's designed to feel personal. Um, They don't need to know your name. They don't need to know your security number to know (laughs) the times that we're living in and the types of uh, challenges that you've been facing that we have been facing for the last few years, the last few decades, the last few centuries. And here's one more straw on the camel's back, right? Camel, of course, connecting us to uh, cancer and the high priestess. Um, So be gentle with yourself this week. Put yourself in timeout. Go for a walk. Drink your water. Make sure you have a good poop in the morning. You know, do what you need to do right? But do it in a way that preserves opportunities for the future. (laughs) Try not to burn any bridges down this week that don't really, really deserve to be burned. But also, this is a week for revolutionary activity and speaking truth to power. So your mileage may vary, you know? right? Pick whichever door, one, two, or three. They're, they all have adventures. <laughs> and, and prizes? I can't guarantee that there's prizes, honestly, not this week. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I've got for you guys. Uh, that's it. I just keep wanting to say take care of yourself over and over and over again, because, because take care of yourself and take care of each other. 
Um, if you have capacity to reach out to other people and help them do so. But if you don't have capacity, don't overextend yourself and then screw yourself and the other person. You know what I'm saying? Just be really authentic with yourself about what you can and can't do this week. It's okay. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. My heathens, I love you so much. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your attendance to the work, capital T, capital W. And um, I hope you have a wonderful week, despite or maybe because of all of this wild stuff that's going on. Blessed be.